We started with this funny little word, from, and we talked about how often we ask that question of others and are asked it of ourselves. Where are we from? And we went a little deeper to know who and what we are from. We talked about grief, that it is the natural and normal response to any loss. And though all of us grieve at some point throughout the day or throughout our lives, we do it in a very unique fashion. We moved on to that little funny word, to. We found that we are always going back to our from. Interesting concept, isn't it? So today on the journey, we come to grace. And it is a long journey between learning of a death and saying goodbye. It's between a rock and a hard place sometimes. There's many months, maybe even years, of hard work, of mixed emotions and feelings, moments of reality that cause us to be in delight or cause us to be in total exhaustion. And on the other side of goodbye, as the Buddha would say, there is always a new beginning. The memories that we have cherished, our pain is lessened, and we begin to claim our healing. The journey from grief to grace is not an isolated journey. People all over this planet every single day take this journey, and yet we all have to take it alone, individually, as well as collectively. And unfortunately, there are no shortcuts. We find ourselves on that route where we are sometimes angry. We yell out in outrage at a belief system that has failed us. We despair at being left behind. We have feelings of guilt because we didn't do or say something. Sometimes we even have feelings of guilt that we are left to live. We search for reason, we search for meaning, while at the same time bargaining with the powers that be to please change it. We're exhausted, we're lonely, and we need a companion. I'll introduce you today to that companion. There's one thing I've been studying longer than I've been studying grief. It is this concept or idea of grace. I tried to count back how many years it's been since I've been writing and talking and researching and thinking and praying and meditating and intending on the word grace. I think this is my 24th year. It is difficult at best to define grace. So I turned to Webster's Dictionary to see what Webster said. And you know when you look in the dictionary and there's little places that tell you this is the definition, but when you turn to grace, it becomes this big. So I'm going to just tell you a few of the 18 different definitions that I found in my version of Webster. Unmerited divine assistance, approval, favor, mercy, pardon, privilege, reprieve, charm. A trait or characteristic such as the grace of youth. We use it as a title to address or reference lots of different hierarchy, such as a duke or duchess, an archbishop or a judge. We call them your grace. In Greek mythology, there were three sister goddesses known as grace. In music theory, there are grace notes. It's a sense of propriety or a right, such as a friend of mine who had the grace not to run again for political office. <laughs> grace abounds within our society everywhere we turn. When I have 
researched it and written about it in my past, I always went back to the origins of this word. In Latin, it comes from gratia, which means charm or favor. It also means thanks. When I looked at Sanskrit writing, it was gratis, which also means thanks or one who praises. The Hebrew translation of grace is hesed, H-E-S-E-D. And that means favor or a loving kindness, much like a steadfast love. We looked at that sort of love, that sort of grace throughout the Old Testament. If you think about the story of Sarah, for instance. And my favorite origin of the word is that from the Greek. It comes from charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, charis. And though that word looks and sounds a bit like the word care or caress, it's more closely translated to that of thanks, gratitude. There's another word in the Greek called kara, C-H-A-R-A, almost identical, and it means joy. And whenever we are treated with favor, we are filled with joy. One in the same in the Greek language. Grace is also a very popular name. You may know a grace. Hannah is the transliteration of the word or name of grace. And the same is true in the Spanish language for Anita means grace. And in French, Jean or Jean means grace. Think about all the times that you use the word grace in your daily vocabulary. We think about dancers who are filled with this fluid movement and we call them graceful on stage. We see birds flying in formation as they grace the skies. We see one who is down and out on their lock and we say, there but by the grace of God go I. We sit down to a meal, and what do we say? Grace. Goodness gracious. There's lots of different translations and definitions. Few words in Christian theology are used more and understood less than this word we'll be talking about today. Grace is mentioned 170 times in our translation of today's Bible. 122 of those are in the New Testament alone. It's often defined as God's unmerited favor. And though that's not incorrect, I believe that that definition is a bit incomplete. Because grace also includes divine gifts that are always flowing in and through us. That was mentioned in today's daily word. And though I've just given you lots of definitions and transliterations of this idea of favor, grace is also described throughout scripture as something that is beyond mere unmerited favor. It is a reality which embraces and permeates every facet of our daily spiritual walk. So, what does this word grace mean? How does it work in our lives? And though in theology the word is surrounded by this air of mystery, actually it's a very simple explanation of the natural flow of the creative process and the creative good the God mind in each of us. Some of my favorite scriptures that deal with grace include one that was just mentioned earlier. My grace is sufficient for you. But I will tell you, when I first started researching this term and this idea, and I read that, I thought, my grace is sufficient for you. And I had the thought, that's all I get. just enough and then I started studying the word enough 
Enough is enough. My grace is enough. Nothing else needed. In Hebrews and in Timothy, grace is talked about as our strength. In Romans and Peter, it talks about grace being able to in establish a reprieve or a renewal within us. And Peter talks about that we grow in grace. Many years ago, I wrote a book, and I had 14 chapters about grace. I condensed them to four, and then I took the whole thing out. Did I mention I've been studying this for some time? My definition of grace has changed over and over and over. But as I was doing the research and as I have met with scholars all over and I've interviewed some of the top names in theology and religion, we mostly agree that there are different types or facets of grace. Natural graces are those that we are living with every day, our physical body, food we eat, the air we breathe. We have what's called uncreated grace, a term you may not have been familiar with, but it is the gift of God, him or herself. It is the God gift within each of us, the indwelling presence of the divine. It is inherent within each of us. It is always there. It has always been. It is our from. And all other gifts apart from that God self are what we call created gifts. And the term created gifts more appropriately applies to those so supernatural gifts within us that establish this creative union. It is our, what we call in unity, our co-creation with the divine. Grace is loaded with meaning. And usually that meaning comes from your childhood, generations before you, religions before you. And some religions have a rather impoverished view of grace, if you will. Some of them, as you know, take it to think that if I do certain good works, grace will be bestowed. If I take and receive of the sacraments, I will have grace. Scripture tells us we will reap what we sow. Scripture also tells us we will reap in fields where we have not sown. I believe that is really the story of grace. Perhaps you have heard in New Thought Circles that some people will become sick because of the errors that they have noticed in collective consciousness. They're sick because they are surrounded by sickness. This would be reaping in a field where we have not sown. We've just entered into the field to reap there. Just as collective consciousness has what we call error thought or error thinking, it too has positive and supportive thought and thinking. And I believe that grace occurs when we reap the good from that collective field, that collective consciousness, where we've not personally sown. I met with Sue yesterday. She's on her path, on her journey. She's going to take a couple of more weeks off, and I've cleared my calendar to be here with you. Though we're out of four words, I'll come up with something else. And she asked me, do you have your sermon ready for tomorrow? She and I have this little funny back and forth thing that ministers have. You either usually get it weeks in advance or it comes to you on a Saturday night or you hope that it doesn't come to you during the joy songs on Sunday morning. And I told her that I had enough in my brain about grace that surely I could just step up there and talk about it. And she said, where are you going with it? Because I'd like to just be on the path with you in the morning. And I thought, I think I'm going to talk about karma. And I went back to my hotel last night, and I started writing about karma. I started studying some of Eric Betterworth's messages about karma. 
I wrote nine pages last night about karma to bring to you today. And I'm not going to mention any of them. It just doesn't feel right for some reason. I want you to think about something that happened to me this morning. We came in early to rehearse. And a couple of the man, band members tried to get into that door right there, and the door was shut and locked, so they had to go around the building. Think about going into your home later this afternoon and shutting all the doors and the windows. Grace is like living in a house with all the windows and doors shut, and yet there's enough air leaking around those doors and windows to provide you with enough oxygen to continue to live. Pretty an amazing thought, isn't it? That is the concept of grace. It's just always there, not always noticeable from our human eyes, but always there sustaining us, strengthening us, renewing us. Our very existence is by the grace of that which you call God. And we don't have to request it. We don't go back into our home every day and say, I hope air comes in. I hope oxygen comes in. It just is there. There's no bargaining for it, no trading for it. It can't be bought. It can't be earned. There's no right to it. There's no more of it, no less of it. Grace just simply is. And certainly we must be willing to accept responsibility for how we live our lives. But let's not get bogged down in the grim and fatalistic acceptance of working out our karma about life. I have mentioned over and over that we have a thought, we believe it, we feel it, and our reality is made manifest. And if at any point that reality doesn't feel good to you, go back to the thought, question it, investigate it, Find out if it's true, because every master teacher has said the same thing. The truth will set you free. Today's scripture we've said once, but will you say it with me again? Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. I love that scripture because it affirms that it was already there. And it says that we have all received it. How do you receive grace? Did you open your arms? Did you open your lungs? Did you open your mouth and nostrils this morning to receive oxygen? Was that an intent when you first awoke? You know, finding ourselves as spiritual beings living this human experience in the midst of all the good and all the not so good is the very foundation of this thing called grace. I believe that the creation stories within the Bible, and there are many of them besides just the one in Genesis, talk about not original sin, but original grace. They talk about the good that was already there all along. And though we move away from it at times, it is always our from. We can always go back to it. Grace is our divine inheritance. It is that which we recognize, but we cannot see. We recognize it, but we cannot hear it. And as Joe mentioned, we recognize it because we feel it and we experience it on a daily basis. It's the promise that we can face a challenge. It's what sees us through the sorrows of the night and the joys of the morning. I want you to think for just a moment, and this is what came to me in the joy song this morning. If I said to you, grace is two-faced. What was your first thought? Grace is two-faced. I ask it that way because 
some of you have might have thought that as I've talked in the past, there's always this mirror image of life. We're looking into the mirror anytime we meet someone on the street or a friend or a stranger. I certainly had that mirror image understanding about my own health and my path to healing. We're always looking at that which we want or we don't want. And when you look in the mirror of life, everything's the opposite, just as you looked in the mirror this morning. Your right became your left in that moment. And when you have limited thinking, you can look into the mirror of life, into the grace of God, and recognize that you can go back to your from. You can go back to the source of your being. You can go back to truth. When I said grace is two-faced, what did you think? We often think that grace is the yes portion of life. That it is the glass half full rather than half empty. It's the kiss on the cheek rather than the slap on the cheek. And yet, we just talked about grace being everywhere, always present. So, isn't grace in its own concept and idea of totality expressed. Think about standing in the rain. You open your umbrella. There is this cool, fragrant, refreshing wetness falling from the sky, and you open your umbrella, and you get under it. You deny it. But if you close that umbrella, you would be receiving it. Scripture states, God lavishes grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. It was already there, and there's just always more of it. Our co-founder in Unity, Charles Fillmore, said these words. We must carefully choose what thoughts we are going to lose in the mind and what thoughts we are going to bind, for they will come into manifestation in all of our affairs. We must carefully choose what thoughts we are going to lose and what thoughts we are going to keep because they will all manifest in every aspect of our life. We have a thought. We continue to have the thought until we believe it, whether it's true or not true. And then we have a feeling. And that feeling is our greatest indicator of whether that thought was true or not. But regardless, it will manifest into reality. Charles Fillmore also said that as a man thinketh within himself, so is he. What he means there is whatsoever a man soweth in the mind, he reaps in manifestation. Whatever thought you're sowing, it's the seed. You're going to reap in the manifestation of all facets of your life. Someone emailed me this last week from this church, and she said, I got it. From equals two. Two equals from. Grief equals grace. Grace equals grief. I told her she didn't have to come to church today. She'd already got the sermon. But I want you to look at those four words again. Really study them and think about it. Because isn't it true that they all equal each other? I believe that grace is our from. It is present in our journey of grief. And it is always our next step going back to our from. And back into the grief. And back to our from. As I mentioned, I have had lots of definitions of grace over the years. Some of them have been as long as Webster's. Some of them has been as short as a word or a face or a name. I think today my favorite definition is this. Grace is my ability to change my mind. 
doesn't that just feel good? Grace is my ability to change my mind. So, if you've ever had a little one in the back seat of the car and you've been on a journey, you've heard the question, are we there yet? I mentioned I have talked to lots of people about this concept of grace. And with permission, I have brought a story that I'd like to close with today. It's from a dear friend of mine named Sherry Curry. She has her Master's in Divinity. She teaches at Phillips Theological Seminary. When I asked her if she would just write her definition of grace, this is what she wrote. Like the rhythmic tick-tock of a clock, grace breaks into each new age as God presence, knitting humanity together with the depth and breadth of unfathomable healing mystery. From the beginning of time, grace permeates the human story. In my own story, grace is a grandchild named Parker Grace. Three-year-old Parker Grace commands attention at family dinners and in worship services. She makes her presence known in the supermarket checkout line. She's apt to skip through the middle of adult conversations, and she cries out in the lonely dead of night. Since the birth of Parker Grace, whenever I think about grace as a theological concept, my point of reference is again a child a presence that comes into life expectantly or perhaps when we least expect it, yet it is always full of promise and hope. As natural as the passing of the ages, as beautiful and wide-eyed as a child, unmerited, irresistible, sufficient, and as great as all the heavens. For me, grace is the mystery of encounter with the divine presence by whom we are created for whom we are made to be in relationship with self and one another. I like her definition too. You know, as I examine these brilliant expressions of grace that I've mentioned, and I know that my expression and definition of grace has changed throughout the years. I've been taught acronyms for grace that no longer resonate with me. I've studied philosophies that are rather illogical to my way of thinking today. But what I know is that the spiritual powers that have been demonstrated by the saints and the mystics and the master teachers from Jesus to the Buddha to Martin Luther King Jr. to every one of you in this room have all been part of a journey of seeking the one power and the one presence. We have all sought after that which we call God. It's an energy that continues to heal even when we are at our lowest moment. So how do we receive grace? Receiving grace, living grace, expressing grace, is always going back to the really deep awareness in the beginning that we all have an awareness of this one power and one presence, though we're not always realizing it in any moment. That awareness is the greater part of us. It is in the recognition of that awareness that grace is. That grace is expressed it is lived. And for me, what used to be amazing grace is today a maze of grace. Thank you for being on this journey with me. Thank you for letting me be with you. I'll see you next week.